Hello, my name is Dr. Jacob Grand, and this is the seventh and concluding video in the series on Schenkerian analysis. So far in the series, we've given an overview of the different kinds of transformations that can take you from one level to the next, but we've kept mainly to the foreground and shallow middle ground levels. This video will focus on the background level and on some of the ways that compositional levels can interact with one another. One of the most important pieces of vocabulary in Schenkerian analysis is the idea of prolongation, and we are finally in a position to appreciate what it means. Prolongation is the mental retention of a tone beyond when it is literally present as a sounding note. And there again is the tone versus note distinction that we mentioned in the second video. So, for instance, if I were to ask you to sing scale degree two, in order to do that, you would have to have some mental awareness of where scale degree one is. In other words, you would have to keep scale degree one in the back of your mind while you pay attention to scale degree two. And prolongation is really nothing more complex or mysterious than that. Let's use as an example this phrase from one of Bach's chorale settings. If I were to assign Roman numerals to each of the chords, we would get something like this. And the only out of ordinary chords in this phrase are these two. It's quite unusual for a piece in A minor to so quickly tonicize G major, the subtonic, scale degree seven, and then to immediately return to A minor all within one phrase. Pay attention to that moment as we listen to the phrase and its repetition. This phrase is not the entire composition, but if we were to pretend that it was, and we wanted to give a complete reduction in analytic notation, we might arrive at something like this. Now, don't worry for the moment exactly how I made my reduction. We'll return to that topic later in the video. Most of the analytic notation here should look pretty familiar, but there's one important new addition, and that is the use of open note heads. Open note heads are for showing tones of the background and deep middle ground, while closed note heads, which we've seen in previous videos, show what's happening at the foreground. Open note heads can be stemmed or flagged or beamed together to show their relative importance and the relationships to one another. And although there aren't any in this graph, Schenker was known to sometimes include open whole notes to represent important background tones as well. A graphic analysis shows prolongation in two fundamentally different ways. The solid slurs and beams show progression from one tone or chord to another, and it makes sense that our graph would be made mostly out of these forward motions. Tones that are contained underneath the solid slurs and beams are conceptually dependent on the motion from one hierarchically important background tone to another. And in that sense, they prolong the background tones. The dashed slurs show prolongation in the original sense of a retained tone, rather than a motion between tones. So this note A and this note A are in a certain sense the same tone. And everything contained underneath the dashed slur is understood in terms of that prolonged A. The idea of prolongation allows us to make very fine-grained distinctions in our analysis. This pitch C, for instance, occurs three times in the melody of the chorale. All three are the same frequency and are performed by the same voice and at the same dynamic. But 
when we compare the standard notation to our analytic notation, we can see that none of the three C's behave the same way. And we can be pretty precise in describing how they are different. The first is a back-relating consonant skip, the second is a passing tone, and the third is one of the most important structural tones of the composition, which I'll talk about later. We can also use the concept of prolongation to tell differences in behavior of different chords and harmonies. One of Schenker's students, Felix Salzer, introduced a distinction between chord grammar and chord significance. Chord grammar is the descriptive labeling of a chord using Roman numerals to identify the chord root and relate it to a key center. Chord significance, on the other hand, is the explanation of a chord's role in the larger goal-directed motion of a phrase, section, or entire work. As we'll see, two chords can have the same chord grammar and very different chord significance. These two chords have the same chord grammar. When we applied Roman numerals earlier, they were identically labeled as 5-6 chords. The only difference is the soprano note, which doubles the fifth in the first chord and the root in the later chord. But when we compare these five chords to their representation in our linear reduction, we see that they have quite different chord significance. The top voice B of the first chord is a passing tone, and the lower voice G sharp is a neighbor note. Salzer would call this kind of voice leading chord a neighbor passing chord. The other 5-6 chord is a front-relating dominant that bears a harmonic relationship to the A minor triad on the downbeat of measure 3. Its chord significance is more like that of the applied dominant that tonicizes G major one measure earlier. So two chords identical in grammar can have completely different chord significance, and it's useful to be able to tell the difference. There's one area of analysis where being able to tell the difference in chord significance is especially important, and that is in Schenker's unique view on melodic motives and motivic repetition. In conventional motivic analysis, like the approaches of Schoenberg or Rady, something can count as a motive if it is compositionally salient, so a memorable melodic interval or a memorable rhythm or chord, these could all serve as a motive. But Schenker realized that his theory of levels also allowed him to talk about motives in an entirely new way. If we look at the melody in measure one, we can see a stepwise ascent from A to C with B as a passing tone. This linear progression in the top voice is counterpointed with a neighbor note pattern in the bass voice forming first species consonances of an octave between A and A, a tenth between the neighbor note G-sharp and B, and another tenth between A and C. If we zoom out, we can see the exact same contrapuntal pattern playing out at the middle ground level between the open note heads on the downbeats of the first three measures. These stretched out repetitions of the soprano and bass motives are called parallelisms, or sometimes hidden repetitions, since they aren't at all obvious on first listening due to the intervening foreground notes. Hidden repetitions like these ones that play out at different levels of the foreground and middle ground are surprisingly common in the music of 18th century masters, and they would go completely unnoticed without a linear analysis. When we want to draw attention to motivic repetitions, whether they happen at the foreground or any other level, we enclose the repetitions in brackets. In this case, there are two different motives, a passing tone figure in the soprano and a neighbor note figure in the bass, so we might even wish to label the motives differently, like motive A and motive B, if that's the focus of our graph. The motivic parallelisms that we just pointed out also bring us back to the chord grammar versus chord significance distinction. We mentioned earlier that this 5-6 chord 
has a neighbor passing voice leading function. Funnily enough, the G major chord, the one that I pointed out earlier was a slightly uncommon harmony, plays the analogous role of a neighbor passing function at the middle ground level. Here we have an example of two chords that have different chord grammar, but actually have analogous chord significance at different levels. Before moving on, I want to stress one last point about Schenkerian motives. You might notice that the bass line jumps between two different registers, and there are only three tones in that low register that are a little bit disconnected from everything else. Lo and behold, they are the same three tones of our neighbor note motive. But this does not count as a motivic parallelism. You can definitely still say that they form a motive in the original sense as a memorable succession of tones, in this case because they are put in relief by their register. But they're not a Schenkerian parallelism because when you compare these notes to where they show up in the analytic graph, they don't literally participate in a neighbor note figure. I didn't even include the low G in measure two in my reduction because it barely participates in the baseline voice leading. There are other kinds of motives, but in order to count as a Schenkerian motive, the note successions have to participate in the same kind of linear configuration, like a neighbor note, a passing tone, or a linear progression, etc. Now we must return to the idea of the ersatz, or fundamental structure, that shows the organization of the background levels of all tonal compositions. Schenker himself considered this the most important part of his theory, even giving it a kind of metaphysical significance. But as I said in the first video, I think we tend to overemphasize its importance when we teach linear analysis. Still, I'll try to give my most charitable interpretation of the ersatz. I'll start by making an analogy to mathematics. This is a famous equation known as Euler's identity. Some mathematicians consider this the most beautiful equation in mathematics, and it is especially elegant in the way that it combines several seemingly unrelated realms of mathematics into a single simple expression. The number e has to do with logarithmic growth rates. The number i has to do with imaginary and complex numbers. Both the numbers e and pi are transcendental numbers, and they cannot be written as ratios or decimal expansions. And yet, when you take these exotic numbers and combine them, we suddenly arrive back at home in the ordinary real numbers at negative one. One way of thinking about the ersatz is that it also summarizes in an elegant way all of the most important concepts in Schenker's theory and brings them into as simple a relationship as possible. First, the top voice descent 321 embodies the contrapuntal concept of goal directed motion in as few notes as possible. Recall from species counterpoint that the strongest melodic closure is obtained by stepwise descent to scale degree one. Now, this isn't an especially impressive melody, but it is the fewest possible notes that embody the principle of goal-directed melodic motion. The bass line also represents the complete harmonic cadence with an initial tonic, structural dominant, and final tonic. The ersatz then is an embodiment of the two main forces in tonal music, counterpoint and harmony. The ersatz is also an expression of the complete tonic triad. For instance, if we were to imagine that the upper voice moved by a neighbor note, scale degrees one, seven, one, instead of three, two, one, not only would we have a less satisfying sense of goal-directed motion, but the fundamental structure would also be missing the mode defining scale degree three. Finally, the only tone of the ersatz that is not a member of the tonic triad is scale degree two. And it is an example of one of Schenker's other key ideas, the linear progression. If scale degree two had simply appeared as a dissonant passing tone, 
it would not have been capable of supporting further middle ground and foreground prolongations. But as it is, scale degree 5 provides consonant bass support, turning the dissonant passing tone into a linear progression. There's therefore a good reason why this happens to be the form that the ersatz takes, rather than some other random group of tones. When you reduce a tonal piece of music back far enough, you reach a point where reducing any further would omit one of those fundamental components of Schenker's theory. So he stopped at this point and declared this to be the prototypical background structure. Returning now to our Bach example, I'd like to also add that there is a big practical benefit to assuming a conventional background prototype like the Urzatz. It makes creating a reduction much easier since we don't have to start from scratch. We assume that there is an Urzatz and then our task becomes finding a way to connect what we see in the score to that background prototype. In this case, I started by looking for the bass arpeggiation, or bass brechum, that will be the lower voice of our ersatz, and that articulates the deepest level harmonic cadence. Each of these tones receives an open note head, and they are beamed together. It's usually then also pretty clear which bass note serves as a structural predominant. And at the very least, those four chords receive uppercase Roman numerals, since they are the most important structural harmonies for the phrase. Then I try to find the tones of the urlinea, or fundamental line, in the primary melodic voice. These also receive open note heads and are beamed together, and we traditionally also label each tone with its respective scale degree above the beam. The first tone of the urlinea is known as the kopf tone, or head tone also sometimes called primary tone. This is the tone that, if we reduced the piece far back enough, it would form a first species relationship with the initial scale degree one of the bass arpeggiation. Therefore, the head tone must be consonant above scale degree one, and the options are either scale degree three, as we have here, or scale degrees five and eight, which we'll look at in a moment. In this piece, the head tone does not arise until measure three. Prior to that, we have what's called an Anstieg, or initial ascent, where the melody ascends to reach the head tone. In this case, by stepwise linear progression from scale degree one, but sometimes also through arpeggiation. This should remind you of one of the common designs of Acanthus firmus from species counterpoint, where the melody often ascends to a high point and then descends stepwise to scale degree one. The ascending phase in our analytic notation is usually shown with this large slur connecting open note heads of the background ascent. And the head tone is the high point and point of inflection where the overall motion of the melody begins to descend. Once we're confident in the skeleton of our reduction, it makes fleshing out the middle ground and foreground tones much easier. The most common form of the ersatz is the one that I just showed, which descends from scale degree three. Descents from scale degree five and scale degree eight are also possible. These are called five lines and eight lines, and they are much less common than the three line for one important reason. Notice that although in each of these cases, the fundamental line has additional tones in its descent, the bass arpeggiation still has only three tones to try to counterpoint against the upper voice. If we end up with long, unsupported stretches of our fundamental line, that might be an indication that what we're looking at is actually middle ground or foreground melodic activity above the head tone of a three line, rather than a genuine five line or eight line. Schenker gives pages and pages of examples of different ways for the bass line to support a putative five line or eight line, and I've chosen to show just two. In the first example, we see a five line counterpoint largely in stepwise contrary motion in first species consonances, except for the second species 
predominant and dominant, which is common beneath scale degree two. In the second example, we see an eight line where the baseline is divided up into two base arpeggiations instead of one that each support a different segment of the fundamental line. These are just some of the possibilities, but in all cases, the two primary voices should form correct two voice counterpoint, preferably consonant first species, as much as possible. In fact, this goes for every level of your analysis, not just the background level. It's usually good practice to try not to analyze the voices one at a time or in isolation from one another. The baseline can give you hints about the structural tones of the upper voice and vice versa. The last subject I want to cover in this video has to do with Schenker's views on musical form. He realized that the theory of levels could be used to dialogue with conventional notions of form which were in his day typically focused on the layout of themes in a composition. Schenker was interested in how conventional formal types would interact with the background level voice leading of his new theory. One important tool that Schenker invented to adapt his backgrounds into discussions about form was the interruption. An interruption happens when the fundamental line descends from scale degree three to scale degree two, and then rather than continuing to scale degree one, we cut the structure off and begin over again at scale degree three, which then forms a completed structure after the interruption. An interruption is indicated with these parallel lines that cut the scale degrees and Roman numerals into two separate groups. You can think of the interruption as a kind of back-relating dominant that hits the reset button on the fundamental structure. The questioning half-cadence-like energy of the five chord resets us back to the beginning to start over again. The five chord that causes the interruption is called a dividing dominant, or sometimes just a divider. Here I've shown a three line, but Dividing dominance can interrupt the progress of a five line or an eight line as well. When a dividing dominant interrupts the ersatz at the background level, it's called an interruption, but divisions like this can also happen at middle ground and foreground levels, and those are usually referred to as divisions. Many antecedent consequent phrases that pair a half cadence question against an authentic cadence answer can be graphed as low-level dividing dominance. Here we will look at the Ode to Joy theme, which you may remember from the second video when we reduced the antecedent phrase into stem and slur notation. Just like the Bach phrase we looked at earlier, this is of course not a complete composition, but our analytic reduction will treat it as if it is in order to illustrate the notation for an interruption. It would be most accurate to say that this theme features a foreground transference of the fundamental structure, which features a dividing dominant. A composition can also be formed around multiple middle ground divisions, as Schenker interprets Chopin's revolutionary etude in an analysis from the five graphic analyses. He shows the primary background interruption with parallel bars running through the staff, which I've exaggerated a little bit here. And then he also shows how the middle ground dividing dominance lead to divisions in measures 18, 41, and 58, by writing the word Tyler in parenthesis underneath. Tyler means division in German. If you compare these divisions to the score of the composition, you will see that Chopin's four-part form maps very neatly into Schenker's fourfold divisions of the fundamental line. When you're talking about form, you have to eventually talk about sonata form. 
and Schenker had a very specific formulation of how first movement sonata form aligns with his background prototypes. Here I've shown the setup for a typical major mode sonata, which features a three line. The most interesting feature of this prototype has to do with the development section. In the five graphic analyses, Schenker analyzes the development section of a Haydn piano sonata and shows how all of the unexpected chromatic twists and turns, which is the area of this graph that I've enclosed in parenthesis, can actually be understood as a prolongation of the dominant carried over from the second theme group of the exposition. That dominant is interrupted at the retransition, and the famous double return of sonata form corresponds with the reset of the fundamental structure. When it comes to other forms, there are many possible ways that background and middle ground voice leading structures can align with the sections of ternary forms and rondos. Here we have the first A, B, and A prime sections of a rondo by Schubert. The first A section modulates from the tonic A flat major to the subdominant D flat in measure 18. The B section then begins in the unexpected key of F sharp minor and ends with a half cadence on a D sharp dominant chord. The A prime section returns to the main theme and key in measure 37. If we compare these events to the background graph shown above, the faraway key of F sharp minor for the B section can be understood as an expansion of the G flat and B double flat inner voices that give passing support to a D flat middle ground neighbor note to the Kopf tone C. Notice also that this neighbor note figure is a hidden repetition of the motive that is bracketed twice in measure one. The point here is that deep middle ground voice leading and Schenker's insistence on interpretations based on diatonic scale degrees can be an outstanding way to explain some of the very remote key areas that are reached in 19th century music. Finally, let's take a big step back and consider the background and middle ground elements that are considered somewhat optional, but that also figure into discussions about form. The ersatz, along with all of its prolongations and divisions and transferences, forms what you could call the structure proper of the composition. This is the body of most compositions and usually governs the largest span of the work. But the structure of the work can be delayed during what one might call the pre-structure. We can delay the onset of the fundamental line through an Anstieg or ascent, which we saw in the Bach example earlier in this video. And we can also delay the onset of the bass arpeggiation through an auxiliary cadence, which is often a middle ground front relating dominant as we have in this example. Sometimes an auxiliary cadence can be a complete transference of the cadence to another scale degree. That is usually the way that Schenker explains 19th century pieces that have extensive off tonic beginnings. Finally, once the final conclusive tonic cadence of the ersatz has brought the piece to a structural close, there is also an opportunity for post-structural content, or what Schenkerians have taken to calling structural coda. Notice that this definition of a coda has to do with the close of the fundamental structure and doesn't have anything to do with the arrangement of themes and melodies. Some compositions will begin a formal coda without closing off the fundamental structure. And so it's very useful to distinguish between structural codas and formal codas. By the way, Sometimes you will see analysts use dashed beams to show the prolongation of structural tones of the fundamental line or bass arpeggiation, and their use to show structural codas is very appropriate. This video course was intended as an introduction to core concepts 
in Shankarian analysis. If you have understood everything in these videos, you should feel confident that you are well versed enough to read and interpret a well formed graphic analysis, and that you can use analytic notation to make sketches and graphs of your own. I'll finish this video with a short bibliography of resources I can recommend if you are interested in learning more about advanced linear analysis. If you enjoyed these educational videos, please like, comment, and subscribe. I may put out more in the future.